that's the history of discipline. By discipline means translation studies. So um, uh, for this, you can refer to page number seven uh, of your handouts. If you have handy in front of you, I'm going to focus on that with the same title uh, of your uh, handout. That is a brief history of discipline. This is page number seven, one point three. Okay, now when we talk about uh, translation studies and the practice of translation studies, uh, when, uh, when when we talk in terms of tracing something in a chronological sequence, I hope you understand what is chronological, talking in terms of history and talking in terms of dates. So when we go back and we find out that initially in first century BC, a uh, practice of translation study was already there, uh, and particularly with St. Jerome's in fourth century, uh, the approach was in that time that within St. Jerome's approach it was restricted to translating Greek Bible into Latin. And this would uh, affect later translations of scriptures as well. So that means initially this, the task of translation was to translate Gre uh, Bible, Greek Bible into Latin. And, uh, and later on, other translations and scriptures and holy books were also to be carried down. But initially, the purpose or rationale of translation was for the sake of, you know, uh, translating these holy books. Okay. Same as the, I'm sure you're familiar the way we have different translations of Holy Quran done by very learned scholars uh, who have done it in different and they come up with their, not only into translation, they come up with their own interpretation, their tafsir, you're all familiar, familiar with that. So this is, you know, in terms of translation initially has its roots in terms related to religion. So the practice of translation is long established, but the study of the field developed into an academic discipline only in the second half of the century. As, as uh, I discussed it um, in the last class as well. Now let me uh, uh, go a little bit in detail. I'm going to read out from my handout and you all be and listen to what I'm saying. So, so writing on this subject of translation goes back in, in the recorded history. And it was discussed, for example, by renowned scholars, Cicero and Horace. And as well as we see that their writings were to exert an important influence up until the 20th century. And then, especially so, as I said, from translating from Greek Bible into Latin and so on. And then till, till the 16th century, for over a thousand years, you know, in the 16th century, uh, you know, this different translations coming up in terms of, uh, of Holy Bible, it was, uh, it was, was you know, like different scholars were coming up with their translation and interpretation of this Holy Book. And that's why it is said that till 16th century, there was this battleground of conflicting ideologies in Western Europe. And as a result, the role of translation in that, they're coming up with the right interpretation of this holy book. So, uh, however, although the practice of translating, as I said, is long established, the study of the field basically developed into an academic discipline in the second half of 20th century. And before that, translation had normally been, it has been, Initially, as I said, you can see in the slide as well, that basically before that translation had normally been an element of language learning in modern languages, language courses. It was the initial role um, in the term of academia, or you can say, or in the term of education was that translation as a strategy was used for language learning uh, in different modern language courses which were conducted. Uh, and that's why that from late 18th century, grammar translation uh, method. It dominated language learning in secondary schools in many countries. Maybe you're familiar with grammar translation method. I discussed with you last week in the class that it's, it's one of the, in fact, it is, it is uh, somebody is, wants to join the, the link. In fact, it is the oldest method of language teaching as well, the grammar translation method. And uh, the focus of this method is somehow in terms, so it just, uh, Shaheen has just uh, joined the class. So the practice, uh, it was used in terms of this is that, uh, as I said, the translation from L1 to L2 or vice versa. So as I said that initially the role of translation in the field of academia was, or in terms of secondary schools was, that translating from L1 to L2, and I gave you example in the class that we still in our school system, in secondary schools, uh, you know, in, in grade 9th and 10th, you have extensive ex 
exercises of translating from L1, which happens in our class, Urdu, into L2, that is English language, and vice versa. So this translation as a strategy was used in language learning in schools in many countries. It, it started, somebody wants to join, from 18th century uh, as a method. Then, uh, in, as I said, the method was applied uh, to, um, was in terms of, uh, you know, other language learning course, courses it, it was as well, especially classical Latin. Uh, and uh, apart from what I just said, um, you know, for translating Bible, also it was applied, this grammar translation method for learning for uh, classical uh, languages like Greek and Latin, and then moving on to learning other modern foreign languages as well. So this continued from it, uh, you know, kind of, uh, as I said, from 18th century onwards for quite, uh, you know, for, a, for another century or so, this method was very popular and it was used in this case, okay? Because the focus of this method at that time, the translation in mind was kind of, it centered on rote learning. So I hope you are familiar with rote learning is that memorizing, memorizing of anything. So um, in that, in this matter in particular, the focus was on memorizing the rules, grammatical rules of the foreign language, of the target language, or the L2, or the second language, like in our case, it is English language. So this memorization, learning, cramming of grammatical rules was a particular feature of grammar translation method. And this was, mind you, why I'm saying translation was that somebody has having an L1 mother tongue different and then learning the second language with this particular method of grammar translation method. So this method had its quite its utility for quite some time. It was being used, as I said, um, in Europe, especially in secondary schools. It dominated in, and the, it was not in one country, it dominated in many countries. And it was known by the name as grammar translation method. And it was also applied in, I just uh, repeat again, for learning classical Latin and Greek, and then to modern foreign languages. And the focus was that it centered on word learning, memorizing grammatical structures, rules of the target language. So the way of practicing uh, these rules was, uh, was in terms of by translation, by a series of translation uh, sent of in which sentences were translated. Uh, and uh, some sentences who were not actually connected, uh, you know, constructed in this, but the, for, just for the sake of practicing the translation, like one sentence of, uh, of L1 was given and the students were asked to translate it into the second language. And then the second sentence and so on. Not necessarily these individual sentences were connected to each other. The rationale was just for the sake of practice in the ta target language and a kind of translating uh, find finding equivalent words in L2 in what you uh, the sentences which you had in your L1 which was the first language. Okay, so this was used as an approach uh, for uh, learning the language. But although this ap approach uh, you know it persisted for quite a few uh, you know uh, uh, quite a number of years in certain countries in a different context, but uh, it 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 was quite successful in, uh, you know and since it's the oldest method of uh, language teaching, it did persist for quite a while. But the, like the way things are when new, uh, new uh, you know, theories come up or new methods come up, so gradually this is what happened with grammar translation method as well. And what happened was, however, grammar translation method fell into increasing disrepute around 1960s and 70s. So what happened is around the era of 1916s and 70s, when the other methods of language teaching became popular, like the direct method, which uh, which was evolved round about in 1960s. And the focus of this method particularly was on the use of target language, because um, as uh, as theorists and, uh, you know, uh, uh, scholars came up with new methods of language teaching, they did focus on the, whatever uh, the shortcomings which the grammar translation method had, they tried to overcome the shortcomings of grammar translation method by focusing, uh, in particular, mm, uh, indirect method on the use of target language, especially uh, for uh, the oral proficiency. The focus was that to let the students or learners, uh, you know, improve the spoken language of the second language of the second language or the target language that they were learning. 
instead of just the memorization of rules, uh, as was the case in the grammar translation method. Okay? And then it was felt that since once they learn uh, and gain confidence to speak in the target language, then it would not be just limited to a few number of, number of sentences which the students had earlier been doing in the grammar translation method. Okay? So this method, as I said, grammar translation method led to this uh, direct method. And this particular method was very, very popular in 1960s and 70s. And it was felt that this particular approach, that is a, a direct method, is stresses on the student's natural capacity to learn language and, and attempts to replicate authentic language. And the one thing was it was also felt that instead of pre-structured sentences, you should make your students be proficient in the language and to use the language in a natural capacity, in a natural surrounding, like the way uh, when a child acquires L1 in a natural surrounding, same would be the case with uh, in the direct method as well, that the students should to learn language, the second language, in an authentic, in a real life situation, uh, so that they gain confidence. So it often um, privileges spoken. So another very important aspect was with this method that then once it felt that now less focus on the written aspect of the language, so it moved on that let's see that they should focus more on the spoken aspect of the language. So uh, this was uh, how, how do you think, how could have this been popular, expecting from students who come to learn a, a second language, a target language, to be able uh, or to just to use the target language only. Initially, it had its difficulty. But gradually, uh, the teachers did make the students realize the significance that they have, in order to gain confidence, they have to speak in the target language. So that was uh, done in ways of you know, telling them that, as a rule, they're just supposed to use the, the second language only, the target language only. And no matter whatever they speak, I mean, the students should overcome their shyness, and they should be able to speak in the uh, in, the, in the target language. And initially, obviously, the teachers would not be very critical or analytical of the kind of mistakes the learners were making, because naturally their job was to make the students proficient, be confident in the target language, and, if, uh, and to kind of tolerate them, uh, tolerate uh, their mistakes as well. Uh, that reminds me that you can connect this uh, grammar translation method with the method which is very commonly used now in language teaching, which is known as the communicative methodology, which also focuses on this aspect, that use of second language only, or the target language only, and the students are not allowed to revert back to their mother tongue. Okay? So, uh, you know, in a way, we can say that this coming up, uh, uh, this development in language, uh, language teaching method of direct method, somehow, the use of uh, translation was kind of uh, being pressed to in the back there because the focus was that use only the target language. And whatever you have to say, it has to be the target. Whatever mistakes even you make initially, they would be acceptable. But at least you gain the confidence and you do try your level best to speak out uh, in the target language. So let's see what happens as a result of this development. So although we talk about uh, the grammar translation method and its restrictions and its, uh, I should say, drawbacks. But somehow, if we are to link with your discipline translation studies, at least in grammar translation uh, method, there was uh, somebody wants to join. They were at least practicing uh, the target language. Here, suddenly, you are talking about, let's see, they have to use the, uh, the target language only. So it kind of, uh, you know, it was like you were restricting them, uh, restricting them to use L2 only. So what happened it, as a result of this policy that at, uh, somehow this uh, you know, uh, abundant use of translation method or frequent use of translation method was kind of limited. And as a result, what happened was it was felt that translation should only be placed or uh, should be the job of only trained professionals, trained translators, or people at, studying at a higher level in a university or different language courses, or people who were getting training to either to be interpreters 
of uh, foreign language or to become professional translators. So uh, the sum of this was streamlined. The translation as a result, uh, you know, should be the domain of these, these professionals only. The professional translators who are getting training and uh, people, uh, students who are getting admissions in higher level university and degree courses. But again, they were doing it out of their own choice otherwise. But uh, uh, previously, what the practice was that each and, uh, you know, it was uh, translation was rampant because in schools, all students were exposed to the grammar translation method. So as a result, naturally, they were translating frequently from L1 to L2 and vice versa. So this uh, kind of this um, decision or this, I should say, this uh, particular step led to uh, is a kind of putting, uh, at least in UK, uh, that the first year undergraduate students who were coming to the university as a result, they were not, they did not have in their life, real life experience or practice of translation because, uh, you know, when they joined a university, it was more of this, it had become a domain for this people who choose this as their own, this as their own choice, as a deception. And the rest was all focusing on, on the target language only. Okay. Uh, the use of the target language only. That uh, I would just like to make a connection here, like uh, you know, translation study as a discipline has been, as I discussed last week, has been been trans offer offered in different universities abroad. Uh, as I said, in the last fifty years, in the last two decades of the twentieth century, so um, uh, this development that means is it also had its impact here, and as we uh, in we are also offering. Uh, in, in, in number of this BS translation course, um, it has been offered for at least four or five years uh, from from now. And similarly, students study it at MS level, MPhil level, and even at PhD level. But that is out of their interest if they want to take this particular discipline. Okay. So so far, this is what the scenario was in terms of grammar translation method in UK. Okay. So far, this was their trend. What they had planned to do. Now we have to see, and just across uh, in the in the um, in um, in USA across, and we have to say across uh, you know Atlantic that what's happening in USA or what was the role in USA in terms of translation was it promoted or not? So let's see that uh, for this you can refer to page five of your uh, handout. So um, uh, in USA, basically translation was restricted. Uh, or it, I should say, rather, it began uh, in literary translations, and this was promoted in 1960s. Now, uh, you'd be uh, asking that what is literary translation? Well, uh, literary translation basically is specific or it's related to uh, like uh, what was happening in grammar translation that was in terms of language teaching, the focus of translation from one language to, to the second language. Here, uh, it meant was that uh, the focus was on reading translations uh, of literary works. And you are aware of what literary works are, like creative writings, novels, or short stories, or dramas, or plays. Uh, this is what is what either you're reading the translated version of any uh, literary uh, uh, creations, as I said, novels or short stories, or uh, trans a translation from any other uh, uh, you know, work from any other part of the world, a uh, kind of translation of that work in English language. So, uh, so in USA, this uh, this uh, trend, it, it it predominant. It was predominant in 1960s in terms of the utility of translation as a discipline. That it initially began, it took its root in literary translation. So I hope so far it's clear to you that what was happening in, in UK and in other parts of Europe, as I just discussed about the history, how it began, you know, talking about um, initially, I, I just want to recap from the first century onwards, fourth century, talking initially of how translating Holy Bible and others, that was the kind of first way uh, of your first practical usage of translation or application, I should say, the Greek Bible into Latin, and similarly, this translation led on, and then it led on to what language teaching courses. You know, that was also across Europe, not just UK only, across Europe, learning other languages. You, you know, I talked about Latin and classical languages, Latin and 
we, they were taught about this method and then moving on to 18th century I talked about that how other methods came up and then the popularity slowly and gradually the popularity of grammar translation the, the method uh, decreased and which led to the involvement of direct method and focus on the target language so um, you know and learning and making the students be able to uh, practice the language in a natural environment as a second language uh, so uh, in USA, I've just talked about that for them, the initial way you know, of or initial development of translation was in the form of literary translation, which was promoted in around 1960s. And let's see that how it all began. I'm just going to read and you all have to be attentive and you can refer to your notes as well. So in USA, uh, translation specifically, literary translation was promoted in universities in 1960s uh, and it was done basically by the translation workshops which were conducted and this was based on I.A. Richards a very famous uh, critic and theorist uh, by attending his uh, particular workshops on criticism practical criticism and this kept on evolving at which began in 1920s but it was basically led till 1960s and there were certain specific universities which were focusing on this translation workshop, that means their contribution specifically in this new discipline was in terms of conducting these workshops and namely University of Iowa and Princeton, they played a predominant role in terms of promoting uh, or setting up these, uh, organizing these translation workshops which were established in these two universities and they were used as a platform for conducting, introducing new uh, translation as a way uh, you know, into the target culture. And then somehow this uh, trend of translation, it moved on a bit further. And not only word for word translation, it moved on to a kind of learning about the target culture as well. So with literary translation, the translation evolved into a new field. That is, you are trying, when you are translating literature from one country to another or one language to another, apart from the language, you are also coming or bringing forth the target culture and this brings forth then the, you are in a position to discuss the finer issues, principles of translation process and then also in order to understand the text in that in this new language you would also be interested in looking up that uh, somebody wants to join that you about the target culture as well that what how uh, you know how this culture of this translation as depicted in the awful how it's different than your own, than the own culture and so on, okay? So this is, as I said, that in USA, translation took its shape uh, in this way. That is literary translate, translation, and the literary translation came up also the translation into the target culture and discussion of final principles of translation process and, and all. So um, in USA, this was given the name of Comparative literature. Now you must be wondering that what is comparative literature? Because this literary translation, when it moved on to this particular domain of comparative literature, that means that now um, in USA the trend was you not only you are translating, uh, you know, in language uh, uh, any literary work from one country to another, then you are also kind of unintentionally only you are running into a practice of comparative literature. Comparative literature, I'll explain it means is that uh, you are trying to compare literature of one country to another. So it's like literature is studied and compared transnationally and transculturally. So what are these two terms, transnationally uh, uh, and transculturally? That means that uh, across you are trying to compare literature of two countries, um, uh, uh, that means from one country to another, and you're talking about what is the difference between these two literatures, uh, uh, between obviously these two countries from where this literature has emanated, and also how is the culture different, and how is it depicted uh, in this, uh, in this uh, in the literary creation. So one thing, uh, uh, you know, this award, this the comparative literature led to was this focus on, or it basically necessitated reading of some literature. Because when you can't, uh, can't, you know, talk of this, uh, this aspect, comparative literature, it was something, reading was involved, the reading skill. 
that uh, how would you be able to compare one literature uh, with another only by reading isn't it so because uh, previously the other uh, the way grammar translation we had that was focused on grammar and structures and translation and all that here we are talking about that you are reading a translated version of a short story in english language but then when you are reading it obviously then you are not only just reading the story on this on a on a particular level you are also Uh, going beyond, uh, you know, an understanding in which culture it emanated, what was the culture background of the of the the writer of the age, and it all led to the growth of uh, another domain, which was known as the cultural studies. Like you, you see how interesting it is that one particular development leads to another, and how these all these concepts in academia are interrelated. that if you talk about literature we started off from say translation and bringing up here in us we are talking about how it evolved or it took its shape in a, in in us in terms of comparative literature that they were focusing on comparison of literatures so it was not just then just literature it opened up doors it opened up avenues to more interrelated study in terms of comparison of culture and and nationally and internationally it all these came up into a very very broad field okay so uh that kept on moving and then what happened was that another very important area of comparison especially in usa uh, of the was in terms of contrastive analysis now you must be wondering what is contrastive analysis as explained a little bit in the class as well basically this uh, this is in terms of uh, you know your focus is on the comparison of the two languages and what would be the these two languages be the l1 that is the mother tongue is and the target language will be l2 so when again you are translating from one language to another uh, linguists in, in special in particular people who are trained to be linguists who are experts in language they would not just be translating word for word uh, they would be more interested they uh, you know as linguists in terms of the phenomena underlying translation in terms of finding out that what are the differences in the two languages because they uh, kind of indulge or they are involved they get involved in this comparison of two languages and they find it that there's so much to uh, when you compare their different uh, different you know I should say the criteria for comparison but then you would also be opening up again as i said that one development leads to another they are although they are interconnected but like the previous trans uh, you know comparative literature was related to culture in translation here this aspect of contrastive analysis was of more of interest to the people who were researching on language rather we talk give them the name of linguists so in particular linguists they got more interested from this uh, translation business by comparing two languages and finding out the difference and similarity of two languages and mind you uh, you'll be uh, you'll be you know interested to know that even in a university like ours where people uh, you know study languages and there are different so many different languages are taught a lot of research has also been conducted in particular in contrastive analysis our students especially coming from different parts of pakistan northern areas gilgit baltistan and others they come up and they bring up very good research so one of our students uh, brought up Uh, you know from balti language some comparison then they see that what is the distinct sometimes they compare it with urdu languages they some com compare it with english languages and then uh, when you study language you know there are different uh, different areas in which you can compare talking about different uh, you know in terms of either it could be the structure of the language or vocabulary of the language or phonology or pronunciation and so on and so forth there's so much to it and then that reminds me that sometimes students come up and see that how there are certain languages which are becoming extinct in different parts of pakistan what's the reason for them and if you compare them with any other uh, you know region local language what is the similarities and difference so uh, this particular uh, field of comparing two languages is very wide it has lot of scope and this is what it led um, as i said in us in particular this translation business led its development or led to this uh, this particular uh, trend i should say um now just be attentive i'm going to read out 
Another area in which translation became the subject of research was the contrastive analysis. So this is a study of two languages in contrast uh, uh, in an attempt to identify general and specific differences. So uh, in, in general, these type of differences are identified. What are the general differences and what are the specific differences between them? And especially so into a systematic area of research uh, from 1930 onwards, it moved on. And then it became popular in the 1960s and 70s. Till 1960s and 70s, this contrastive analysis uh, was carried on. And mind you, um, contrastive analysis, apart from its interest in what the linguists um, or people who are doing the business of translation, it also had its application for language teaching as well. People who are working as practice as uh, practicing teachers or researchers or uh, you know uh, or doing the research on elt that is english language teaching they also found it a very good uh, you know way of uh, you know uh, analyzing the errors of the students because uh, you know sometimes coming up and finding out why certain students are making different types of people students from a different region of the country they are committing certain types of errors which are more common then they see that what are the reasons for that either it's the reason of the mother tongue interference in terms of uh, you know mispronouncing some words or in terms of grammar or structure so this is you know um, you know uh, these people who are into this field of translation and contrastive analysis or experts they uh, who, they, uh, they can carry or conduct research in this particular perspective as well okay a kind of contrasting these two uh, the languages um, so it developed into a system of research in USA from 1930 onward, came to the fore in 1960s and 70s. And then translation and translated examples provided much of the data, as it, as it seems, for research being carried out by different researchers. Uh, then later on, contrastive approach heavily influenced other studies. As I said, that one research in a field leads to research in other fields interconnected. So, which overtly stated their aim of assisting translation research. Although useful contrastive analysis does not, however, incorporate social, cultural, and pragmatic factors, nor the role of translation as a communicative act. So he says that when we talk about in particular con contrastive analysis, their focus is basically uh, you know, in terms of the data, concrete data they, which they get of the two languages, which they're trying to compare. And uh, although it could be useful, sometimes they do incorporate the social, cultural background uh, or other reasons which have led to it. But sometimes they can just, uh, you know, in a neat manner, conduct, conduct the comparison. So the continued application of a linguistic approach in general, and such as the generative method or functional grammar, it kept on moving. And this research or this subject gained popularity all over USA. So while in some universities, translation continues to be studied as a module on applied linguistics, but at the same uh, time, in USA in particular, although translation continued and it, it continued to be studied as a module on applied linguistic courses, but then what ha happened, it has its own systematic models were incorporated to it, and then the construction of new discipline involved, it, mo it moved on and on, okay? So um, this is how, as I said, it moved on from one from one field to another, and it gains and it gains its popularity and moved on. Uh, then we move on that um, another systematic and mostly linguistic oriented approach. This happened in translation round about in 1950s and 60s, and this was a kind of uh, uh, contrastive analysis approach. Um, you know, conducted by different researchers. Two or three very prominent researchers which were conducted in this particular domain of languages, we can say, which are related to translation, was one conducted by Jean Paul Wene. And uh, the focus was on this categorizing or comparing French and English. And then another was conducted between French and German by Alfred Malvin. And um, yet another was conducted from other languages. And then Eugene Neda incorporated at this end. Let's not forget at the same time, a lot of research was being conducted by Chomsky. You're familiar with Noam Chomsky and his idea of generative grammar. 
but that also had its uh, you know it had its reflection or as its popularity for research being conducted in different domains so uh, what as i said earlier that how it initially started uh, translation studies as a um, as a, as a discipline gaining its popularity from translations of uh, bible how they used the bible translators started off on them then moving on to practical manuals and so on and so forth and this then this field kept on moving and kept on changing with the with the span with the with what was happening around in the world at the same time it kept on moving and it kept on progressing till the time we talk about um, as i said the first uh, two decades of the 21st century the time we are here in that it came up and in between i've told you about uh, you know i'm not going to repeat that but i did in the class regarding the effect of globalization how it affected then the you know translation in the last two decades of 20th century and in 21st century and how this particular discipline finally gained its ground became popular and um, more so this happened from starting from 1990 onwards to the 21st century where we are here at the moment and uh, then i discussed regarding the role of the electronic media the explosion of like electronic media how it led to Uh, to immense popularity with the process of globalization like talking about one culture spreading of that culture around ev everything so that also again led to um, you know popularity of this method because it was felt that with translation you it played a cru crucial role in aiding understanding um, and, and you know at the one time as i said we talked about a unified world in globalization but yet at the same time it was felt It, the translation became popular from this aspect that this led in understanding the individual identities of the people when people from different parts of the world then they talk about world as a global village and then they travel and they meet and then again each one of us or each one of these people stick would like to stick to their own personal identity their own roots their culture their religion and everything so that again came uh, you know in terms of translating back in, and translation did help Uh, in help increasing this fragmentary world we, although apparently we say this is global world but when people from different parts of the world merge together in this in this platform it is felt that they the cracks are there each one wants to maintain their crucial identity so uh, the role of a translator more became like a traveler who was traveling engaged in a journey from one source to another by one source means from one language to another and as i said 21st century uh, it, it, uh, since it's an age of travel people tell this, this i'm talking the pre covid era people uh, are you know extensively traveling from one place to another so it had its immense development it all this what was happened uh, um, in terms of the scenario uh, it, it 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 had a major development or a major impact in the development of translation as i said in the early 21st century and then coming back uh, you know linking up in the present year this popularity of this discipline in different universities of um, of the world translation studies was being uh, taught starting from hong kong to brazil from montreal to vienna and even in asian countries and let's not forget that our own university namul is also now on the map of world global uh, uh, on the global world of translation studies because it started offering courses in translation studies and all that so with so much energy so much directed in this phenomena naturally you can say that what all happened was this this uh, uh, this aspect of development of translation studies so this is all i'm trying to link up under this broad topic uh, because i would like to wind up this topic of tracing the history of uh, this particular discipline um then uh, you could refer class to the second handout which i gave to you in the class this is by susan besnet what i'm going reading from now is i uh, moved on to the second handout and it's i think page number 2 when you hand out so uh, the trend uh, basically what happened uh, was that especially so during this century was on corpus space translation now you must be wondering what is corpus space translation corpus is when you get a uh, real life data of language okay and then you try to analyze by real life data that means language from everyday usage trying to get it 
And it could be anything like a travel brochure. It could be like a conversation, a dialogue, a story, and everyday conversation taking place anywhere in a situation. So when you try to get this, this kind of a data for, for this aspect of translation inquiry, it provides real life, um, you know, real life sample of real life language, the way it is used. And uh, it helps in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the in moving from a very, uh, should I say, a very natural uh, situation in which you are going to translate, uh, uh, you know, from which, the, you know, you get the corpus based translation inquiry from this particular um, background which is happening, the language, everyday language spoken around you. Okay. So uh, another thing is naturally, if you are going to get data from everyday, everyday life, people speaking, every, you know, normal language which is spoken, obviously there will be diversity, um, you know, in terms of getting the data, the, diver the data would be so diverse. And then again, from this aspect of translation studies, people who would be conducting the research, they would focus on the cultural aspects and other aspects of how this data is different. One data A is different than data B or comparing, but this would be in terms of very, very technical research, comparing the language involved in uh, these different types of corpus data, okay? And then uh, the rest is all on page three regarding the contribution of different uh, scholars. You can just read it and see that, uh, you know, give it a reading just to see what is the contribution of these different people who came up with that and we move on. And uh, then um, basically, as I said, is I'm just going to quote uh, from, you know, Oxford Guide to, to Literature in English Translation. Theorists and scholars have a far more complex agenda than deciding between the good and the bad. And they are concerned, for instance, to tease out the different possibilities open to the translator and the way these changes take place, historical, social, cultural, and so on and so forth. Okay, And uh, so same is the case uh, with uh, this translation. But now when we talk about any uh, any uh, any uh, genre of literature, should I say, uh, to guide uh, any genre of literature in order to be accepted by a literary canon. Uh, this uh, is a literary canon means that there's a kind of a benchmark, or it's it's a level of acceptance. So uh, when did uh, uh, the role of uh, or translation gained its or gained the status of a literary canon, or like it was accepted? Uh, as, as a literary canon, a part of that, or did it play its role in shaping the literary canon? It all moved on, and then, uh, you know, uh, it moved on, and it, it got, uh, you know, uh, should I say, accepted at this level, And but it had to follow certain ethics, certain, there were some determining factors, or there were some determining rules, which were to, to play an important role in. Um, in this particular, um, you know, act of translation. Okay, so um, I would just like to, uh, you know, stop here uh, for that, and you can take a minute or two in asking questions because from my side, uh, this particular topic of um, is over um, in terms of, uh, you know, I, I was basically focusing on this very important aspect of tracing the history of the discipline. Okay. Uh, so if you have any questions, and for this, uh, you can revise when you go home both the handouts which I've given to you uh, last week. Just go there and give it, uh, give it uh, you know, intensive reading, try to understand. We can also discuss in the class as well, so inshallah, when we meet uh, on Wednesday. Uh, as you know, according to this timetable, this hybrid timetable, uh, we have a class uh, at 3.50 till 4.30 on Wednesday. Uh, in the campus. Now, um, uh, before I take up, uh, I've almost taken the attendance, but I'll take the attendance again at the end of the class. Now, if you have any questions, one by one, you people can ask me, uh, and then uh, I'll tell you what you're supposed to do next. Okay. Uh, it's open, the house is open for question answers now, one by one, yes. Okay, Irfanula, yes, now you can, uh, what's your question, Irfanula? So I hope you have your mic on, because I can't hear you at the moment. Okay, 
I said, one by one, you can ask questions, class. You should be having, can you all hear me? Obviously, you can. Yes, ma'am. OK. So Irfanullah, you, uh, what is your question? Uh, ma'am, uh, can we uh, join your class on campus? We are in hostel here in Naman. No, no. This has to be, uh, we are not allowed to have anybody in the class. The rationale for having online classes is that you stay wherever you are at your home or hostel or so. Uh, we also enjoy coming and having a look at you and face to face teaching. This is not allowed. It is not, there is a rationale for that. They don't want overcrowding in the department. So, if you classrooms, then you can do it. If you can do it, why not the others? The policy is there. So, you can ask me a question now. We have, inshallah, on day after tomorrow, Wednesday, which is class. In that class, you will be sitting, inshallah. Okay, right? And what I can see is, I think probably last week, very few of you turned up in my class because that was the first and second class uh, that the classes shuru hui first and second of March. So, aap ki strength bahut kam thi. I can see that most of you are here. Okay. Or kya question hai, bache Any any other question? Uh, If you don't have any question, then I will just take your attendance. Okay. And uh, after yes. this, what we are going to study that uh, now we are studying the history of translation studies. After that, what we are going what, to study? What will be the new topic? Uh, probably yes, that I let. Okay, hold on. That I let you next in the next class when I come. I will be may uh, be ready with my handouts and all that. Okay. So it it has it is related. No, 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 I, was just, uh, I was just asking for the purpose that because uh, because uh, these all the chapter which we are studying it is all theory. So that's why I you know. Okay. Uh, okay. Hold on. Okay. Um, you have a good question, Muhammad Hussain. The reason is that this is uh, this translation studies. It has to be theory based. Okay. Because this is something totally new. You are being at the moment introduced. I think more or less this entire course is based on theory. It will be next topic would be something related to this is that there are different, um, should I say, schools of thought. Normally, when somebody uh, talks about translation, we always get the feeling that it has to be word for word translation. Okay. But then you will come to know that this is not the end. There are other uh, theories as well that uh, translation not always has to be word for word. Sense for sense and then you'll come to know these are all very, very different areas. And these this has to be related to theory. At least uh, I haven't seen any topic which talks about practical translation. Maybe at the end of the course, out of interest, if you're interested, I can give you an exercise in the class, a passage they case for translate from L1 to L2. But if the practical translation, which you already have, and experience at metric 9th 10th us type ki koi scenario nahi in our course this course this is something very very technical and naturally it is something new as well this discipline so isme ye cheeze aise theory se related zyada hain jo aapki course outline hai and naturally we are bound teachers are bound with the course outline because we have to teach you uh, the areas on which you will be examined and since uh, this is a course outline which has been made and which has been, you know, it, it is implemented. So, um, you know, this is what we are going to follow. And uh, it, it will be related to theory. My concern was that I was thinking about disciplines related. I was thinking that we have done it in the same way. 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 We have done it in the I will give you an, um, you know, an, a, a sample. I think this is what you want. Ke actual
تمام क्लास आवाज आ रही है मैम की नहीं तैयार नहीं आ रही है नो no. मुझे आ रही है मेरे साथ पर्सनली कॉल पे मैम आई थिंक सो मैम का इंटरनेट इशू है क्योंकि मैम मीटिंग में नहीं है नहीं मैम चलो तैयब गाना सुनाओ कौन सा सुनेगा इंग्लिश ये पढ़ा दे क्या मैम ने क्या पढ़ाया है तो कुछ समझ नहीं आ रहा शुरू में शुरू में थोड़ा मुश्किल लग रहा है थोड़ा सा शुरू में जो मैडम ने पढ़ाना स्टार्ट किया उस टाइम थोड़ा सा मुझे कंफ्यूजन आगे फिर सही था Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, just some disruption. The uh, you know, sorry for this disruption. Okay. We're talking about. I think there was this question regarding. It was, it was a good question in terms of okay, will there be any practical? Okay, let's move on. I mean, I will uh, try to include something of what you want a little bit, a sample of actual criticism of me of a kind of a criticism. Uh, you know, literary. Uh, translation of some text, the way it is and how it is being analyzed. But at least let's move on uh, with topic-wise. Okay, see already. Now, your three classes, ke bajaye har har subject kisi do classes hongi. You are aware of this this change. Or usme bhi ab ek hamari online class hogi aur ek uh, on campus. Okay, fine. So let me take your attendance and then uh, that would be uh, for today. Of okay, uh, Faiza is here. Faiza. I'm present. The tender. Okay, present. Muhammad Nadim. Uh, Muhammad Yakub. Uh, now, those of you who have left, who joined and left the meeting. The Excuse reason, me, ma'am. Ma'am Nadim, ki jo mic ka masla ho present hai. Okay, Muhammad Yakub. Muhammad Yakub. Okay, Tarik Hussain. Arsalan. Present, ma'am. Okay. Ali Raza. Present, ma'am. Present, ma'am. Present. Present. Amir. 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 This is Amir or Amir Hamza. I'm sorry, you are. Okay. Okay. This is Ishwa Raza. Ishwa Raza. Present, ma'am. Muhammad Shweb. Present, ma'am. Rida, uh, Ajaz, Shaheen. Present, ma'am. Farheen. Uh, Tayyab. Present, ma'am. Present. Who? Who's present? Farheen. Farheen. G, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Tayyab Hassan. Uh, present, ma'am. Uh, Rubina. Okay. Rubina Bibi. Rubina. Present. Okay. Okay, Muhammad uh, Faz. Muhammad. Present. Okay, Omaima Bhatt. Omaima Bhatt. Irfanullah. Present, ma'am. Ibad. Ibad is absent. Muhammad Zubair. Present, ma'am. Uh, Fahad. Uh, Fahad Javed. Laiba Noor. Uh, Zahiruddin. Present, ma'am. Okay, Sabahat. Present, ma'am. Okay, Kinza. Kinza is present, here. Present, ma'am. Okay. And this uh, Nan, uh, Nan Tara is not here. Okay. Right, okay, that's all for today, class. Then, inshallah, see you on Wednesday. And just give it a reading. This, this area, the way it has been traced, the history of the discipline, this is like end of the first topic. So give it a uh, uh, critical reading. Muhammad Nadim and Muhammad Yaqub, are you there? Ma'am, uh, Muhammad okay. Nadim ka mic ka, if you have a present there. Achha, chale, bas, chale, okay, thank you so much.
Okay, see you on the campus on Wednesday. Okay, Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.